All right. It looked like we are live. And hello, everyone. How are you guys doing today? How's your Monday going? Um, feel free to let me know in the comments if you guys have any questions or any topics you want to chat about. Um, or if you've got just a comment you'd like to make, we would love to know where you guys are, are from, if you're in the U.S. or outside the U.S. Um, so anyway, I thought I would start off the live stream today just kind of encouraging those of you who are new to horses. Hi, Lucas. Good to have you on today. I saw a comment in one of the videos. Um, and someone had said, you know, hey, I really appreciate that you're, hey, Eva, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Someone had said, hey, you know, I appreciate that you are so open and chill about beginners in horses because, you know, it's, uh, it's very discouraging as a new person wanting to get into horses, feeling like I don't have enough experience yet. And that comment really touched me because I know that's how I felt when I got started. Hey, Rebecca. Hey, Roger. We got Belgium. We got the U.S. Very cool. Um, so anyway, I think my, the comments are on a delay. So sorry if I'm talking and then <laughs> interrupting and saying hi to everyone. But it's nice to have you guys on here. Um, so again, let me know if you've got any questions. Feel free to type them in and I'll just keep talking as we're going here. But, um, but yeah, I wanted to speak to this today because I feel like this is something that is super common in the horse world is that you get a lot of naysayers you get a lot of people that are very discouraging of people wanting to get into horses and when you talk to them it's like they're either complaining about how expensive and awful being a horse owner is or you know they're saying oh no you you need to have a decade's worth of riding experience and you need to be at this level and and you know they've got a whole bunch of hoops that they expect you to kind of jump through and, um, and I get that, like, you know, on one hand, I've talked to people who do horse rescue and people who teach uh, lessons and, you know, they see people get hurt or they see horses get hurt. And so they have concerns. But on the other hand, I just wanted to be encouraging of those of you that are new horse owners or prospective horse owners. Maybe you're like, I want to do this horse thing, but everything I read is really overwhelming and discouraging. Um, and I just want to say, like, you know, you can still do it. You can still go for it. You don't have to be an expert to get started in horses. Um, hey, Carolyn. Hey, Tara. Hey, Rachel. Good to see you guys again. How are you? Um, yeah, you don't need to be uh, a super advanced professional just to start yourself out in horses. Um, there are a lot of horses out there that are great fit for beginners, and they are marketed that way. And you know, my advice and what I try to kind of talk about in my videos is, you know, get yourself educated. Absolutely. Get lessons, get some experience. I think having at least one solid horse person that you trust in your life, whether that's a trainer or an instructor, or maybe you get hooked up at the barn that you end up boarding your horse at and you can start to get to know people. I always think that's a huge asset just simply because that's something I didn't have when I got started and I wish I had had because now that I'm around more experienced horse people, I feel like I'm learning at an exponential rate and it's helped me a lot. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. Like I totally get it. If you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling like, you know, all the experienced horse people are kind of on you starting out in horses or trying to make it impossible to get started and, and it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I think if you, if you get the right horse and if you're connected or committed to being um, educating yourself and improving, you can absolutely do it. Uh, so we got a question from Dragonfly Fragment. Question for you. I am starting the shopping process. I currently work and ride at a lesson barn. Awesome. And there is an option to half lease back to the barn for lessons. Do you think it is a good or bad, a bad idea? Um, okay, so if I'm understanding the situation you're being offered is that you would pay for a half lease, so you'd get to ride this horse two or three times a week, right? And um, and you'd be doing it in, what does it mean back to the barn? Does the barn own the horse? And so you're paying paying that lease and getting lessons out of the deal, in which case that's amazing. 
Um, I, I have noticed that a lot of people that lease horses will at least give you a lesson, right? They want to show you how to handle the horse and how to manage the horse. But maybe I'm, I'm obtuse and I own, oh, sorry. Okay, I own the horse. Leasing back to the barn for a cheaper board. Okay, so this is your horse and the barn is asking you, hey, you know, we'd like to use your horse as a lesson horse, basically, and we'll give you a discount on board. Um, you know, if if that's something that financially would really help you out and you trust the people that are um, going to be handling your horse, like the instructor, if you trust their judgment that they're not going to put. Um, yeah, so the horse would be in lessons with beginners. Yeah, I mean, I think that can be a great option to offset your expenses. Um, and it's also a way for your horse to get more experience and more practice. If I was in that situation, I would just want to make sure that whoever is going to be uh, the the instructor that's handling my horse is someone that I trust, um, that they are going to make sure that my horse isn't getting his mouth totally yanked on all the time. Um, to a certain extent with beginners, I mean, they do have to learn somehow. So people are going to be making mistakes on your horse. Um, so that's something I think, you know, you have to decide for yourself if you're comfortable with that. But, um, you know, I think there are pros to it. And I think it's kind of just weighing the pros and cons. Like, okay, the pros are that my horse is getting out more often. My horse is getting experience with different riders. Um, and, uh, you know, potentially the downside. And, and of course, you're getting the discount on board. Potentially the downside is that you are having, you know, not maybe handling your horse all the time in the way that you would prefer. But if you've got an instructor managing that well, um, I would feel much more comfortable about that. So hopefully that helps. Thank you for your question. Going to go back up here. Um, Grace, what is your favorite horse name? Fame. <laughs> you know, I wish I could take credit for his name, uh, but he came with that name. And so I feel very fortunate. Uh, it's it's a different name and it's short and easy and I, I really like it. But uh, there's a lot of good horse names out there. Sometimes I think if I had multiple horses going with a theme, right? Like music or art or something be fun to name a bunch of horses after like classical composers so you've got mozart and beethoven and chopin i don't know i'm kind of nerdy <laughs> uh let me know let me know you guys what what your favorite horse name that you've heard of so far is in the comments i'd like, love to see some cool horse names caroline do you prefer western or english oh that's a good question um i ride western that's just kind of what I've been doing for the last several years. I originally started out when I was a teen taking lessons doing English. And um, I think I like, I mean, Western kind of suits the, the trail riding aesthetic. And so that's kind of why it's worked out well for me. Uh, English, I think I, I do want to try some dressage at some point, just because the more I learn about dressage and how it teaches a horse to be supple and balanced, I think that would be really great to teach fame. And for me to learn myself and just expand my horsemanship. Um, just as an aside note, I know a lot of trainers will say, oh, you know, you should start English because it forces you to develop your seat better because there's no horn to rely on. I was talking to a girlfriend about this. Actually, we were horse camping. She, um, she's done barrel racing and uh, a lot of competitive Western sports. And she actually started off with a trainer that was very intent on never letting them handle the horn like they could not rely on the horn for balance and so she i think developed a really good seat and uh so a lot of it i think depends on how you're trained and what your instructor maybe lets you get away with one thing that i will say though is nice if if you're riding a green horse or a horse that spooks on trail it is nice to have sort of that emergency handle if you need it but of course you don't want to be relying on it uh but yeah i just ended up in western it it's a very casual and it just kind of the vibe worked for me but i would like to try english at, at some point too i have a dressage saddle for fame i actually uh test rode him when i went to buy him in a dressage saddle it was so comfortable <laughs> so yeah i'd like to get back to that eva i'm scared no one will lease the horse out to me because i have a disability and i'm in a wheelchair even though i've been riding normally for a long time okay props to you eva um or hopefully it's is it eva or Ava? Um, yeah, I mean, you might maybe seek out some therapeutic writing programs, um, and just let them know that you've got some special 
considerations, then you're looking for a horse that will um, be a good fit for you and see if maybe they have some lease options. I think it's just going to be a matter of finding the right person and asking and and seeing where you go from there. So hopefully you can find find somebody. But that's really great that you've been keeping at your lessons and keeping it riding. That's awesome. Victoria, question for you. My gelding is quite forward on the trails and I am not comfortable with the forward horses. I've always had lazy schoolmasters. Any tips on how to get comfortable with the speed? Actually, do I do. Something comes to mind today. I was uh, on trail yesterday and recording GoPro because a lot of you guys had mentioned you would rather hear hear me talking and hear fame clomping. So I've been working on some of those videos. And one of the things that I was thinking about as I was writing is when I got on trail, fame is also very forward. And I also have, have and sometimes still do struggle with confidence as a rider in terms of speed. Um, I've fallen off of him twice. And so I've had a lot of trauma related to that that I've had to really work through. And I find going uphill is a time on the trail where I feel the most relaxed and I feel the most comfortable to try going a little bit faster. Um, so for, for whatever reason, obviously downhill, there's a lot to maneuver. And for safety reasons, you don't always want to go fast downhill, right? It could be slippery. Depends on how balanced your horse is too. And then the flats, you know, I still had a little bit of butterflies um, when we were first riding. But uh, going uphill for some reason helped me feel more confident and relaxed. And I don't know if that's a balance thing. I don't know if it's um, just knowing that because he's got to work harder going uphill, he's maybe not going to take off quite so much. But for whatever reason, for me, psychologically, that was how I got started feeling comfortable going faster on trail was that I would pick some gradual uphills where I could see ahead. Obviously, there wasn't going to be a a cyclist that was going to come ripping around the corner in 10 feet. And that would be when I would cue him to go a little bit faster. Maybe we would trot and then I would post a little bit faster and a little bit faster to let him know, okay, we're working up, we're working up, working up. And then, you know, kiss and and sit back. And I found that that kind of has helped me um, transition from, okay, I'm feeling a little more comfortable on the trail to, okay, I, I want to try going a little bit faster. Um, so hopefully that gives you some input, some help. Um, that's kind of what has worked really well for me with trying to go faster on the trail. Okay. Caroline, your horse is really cute. Thanks, Caroline. He is. He's he's a cutie pie. I've been working on the ponytail in front. Someone was suggesting to get a little bow for him. I'm getting a book actually right now. I'll probably I'm gonna try and get this lady on the show, which would be amazing. Um whoop. I don't know if you guys can see. Horse Brain, Human Brain came out last year. She is a neuroscientist from UCLA with a ton of horse experience. And I am learning so much about what, um, how horses, what their vision's like, what their hearing's like. And one of the things that I did not realize is that their vision actually isn't so great. Um, Their ability to see edges of things in the distance is kind of poor. They can make out movement really quickly and really easily, which is why, you know, they might spook at something that you go, oh, that was a bird. That's not a big deal. Uh, we can see the edges of stuff, but they can't see that part so well, but they can detect movement. So I've tried to kind of keep his hair out of his face when we ride to see if that helps. Uh, so Victoria, my gelding's name is Sullivan. His show and registered name is Code 2319 from Monsters, Inc. When the monsters got this stuff. I love that. That is so cool. Very cool. Nadine, I... I rode a horse that was called Chucho, which basically means boobs. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys. That is awesome. Rachel, I know an ex race horse named Trendy Windy. Mmm. Trendy Windy. Grace, I also like the name Beamer. Yeah. Hey, Ellis, Kaylee's Corral. Hey, hey, everybody. Abby, welcome. Glad to have you. Ava, okay. Cool. Thank you for for correcting me. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. I'm going to butcher your name. Is it 
Gwenelle, Juche, let me know. Quick question. Do you, do you know what an active stable is and are you interested to put your horse within this kind of structure? I actually don't know what an active stable is. So if you don't mind maybe explaining in the comments. And as I'm scrolling down here, I'll, I'll come back to your question. Um, if you could explain that a little bit more. Tara, I have a back injury that if I get in a serious accident could become worse. I don't do show jumping anymore, but I still ride and I want to look into trail riding and looking into buying a horse. Awesome. Oh, well, I'm so sorry you had that accident. Um, but props to you for wanting to continue on your horse journey and figuring out ways to make that possible. Uh, yeah, trail riding is super fun. So I definitely am excited for you. Pickle is another good horse name, TSBS. Nika, I ride a horse who goes super fast uphill. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, so if your horse gets even speedier uphill, then maybe that is not the time to practice building your confidence with greater speed. Uh, you know, another thing that I've noticed with Fame too is I, if I know he's really fresh uh, and it's going to make me a little bit nervous. Like I noticed, you know, we didn't get a whole lot of riding in December, January. And it was really interesting for me to see how come, you know, February, I found myself having a little bit of butterflies. And I realized that that benefit that you have during the, the good riding season of the summer months where I was out there really consistently working really consistently, um, it was kind of like a systematic desensitization. <laughs> And then we we took kind of a long break and I found myself feeling maybe a little bit more nervous again at certain times. Um, so knowing that and then knowing he's also a little bit fresh from just, you know, not getting as much activity, I deliberately chose trails that had really aggressive inclines right from the beginning uh, because I do find that that kind of helps tire him out. Um Every horse is different, but I think a lot of horses, if they're faced with a, a pretty good incline, if you've got hills in your area, uh, that helps too. I find that he's a little, he doesn't rush quite so much because he's got to work harder. So he's got to focus on where to put his feet and keeping his breath and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so that's been a, a helpful thing that I've started doing more of now that we're getting back into it, trying to get the conditioning back up, all that kind of stuff. Victoria, I love that idea. I'll find some hills. Cool. Glad you liked it. Thank you. America Washington. Hello. I am new to your channel. Welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you for your content. I was wondering if there are specific boots you need for riding Western. Yes, this is a fabulous question. Um, so you'll notice the English ladies, and I, I love you English ladies. You get to have the matching saddle pads and the matching breeches and everything. So cute and sexy. <clears throat> uh, English folks will wear the long black boots that go up to their knees. Western, typically people will wear jeans, boot cut jeans. So if you, you know, you go shopping and you hear all these different cuts, boot cut originated because you needed space in the pant leg for your boot. And uh, you wear boot cut jeans and Western boots. And Western boots are specifically designed. I don't have any shoes with me in here. Sorry, I'm barefoot right now. Uh, they're designed to have a big heel so that you can keep your heels down in the stirrups and not risk having your foot slide through. So if you've got, let me see if I can demonstrate this here with something with my hand. Okay, so this is, this is the toe of the boot, this is the heel of the boot, and if this is the stirrup, the heel is supposed to prevent your foot from potentially sliding all the way into the stirrup, and if you fell off and your horse kept running that you wouldn't theoretically get drug or what have you. Uh, this is very extreme worst case scenario, but it exists for a reason. So you want to have some kind of heel on your boot when you ride. And there are, there are all kinds of Western boots. There are what are called snip toe, where the toe is very, very pointy. There's rounded toes. There's more squared toes. All that kind of stuff is personal preference. Personally, I would probably avoid the snip toe as a beginner because the snip toed boots do tend to curve up at the toe. And I have found that sometimes when you're trying to pull your foot out, that curvature kind of gets caught on the syrup. So just a basic good Western boot with a, with a heel would be helpful. The really experienced cow um, horsemen that I know straight up have like 
high heel boots because they sit real deep in their saddle and they're working with cow horses that are juking and flexible and moving around real quick. And that kind of really helps them keep a very secure posture. Um, but as long as you've got some kind of heel, uh, that's an important part of a boot. And breaking them in, um, I when I get a new pair of boots, they're usually on the stiff side. So I will add some kind of leather conditioner on the outside to kind of soften them up. And, uh, and then eventually they kind of fold and crumple appropriately around your foot and around your ankle. So hopefully that, that helps. If you have any more boot questions, let me know. Working, working down here through the, through the questions. Uh, uh, uh. Nice. Yeah, it's a good book, Grace. Definitely worth checking out. Those of you that are interested in learning more about how horses' brains work, really enjoying this read right now. Okay, Shelby Sampson says, hello. Do you have any suggestions or tips for someone who's been riding for years and is looking to buy or lease a horse for the first time? <laughs> Congratulations. I'm currently a full-time student and have a part-time job. Okay, so you're busy. Um, I think a lease would be a great place to start uh, simply because it'll help you figure out more of what, what you want and with your schedule, what's going to be a good energy level too. Uh, one of my videos, I was talking about how, you know, some horses need to get out a certain amount and have a certain amount of exercise during their week. Otherwise, they are really challenging to work with when you do pull them out, let's say on the weekend. And the people that I know that kind of manage the whole weekend warrior thing are either, you know, they're leasing or they're paying someone to work with their horse during the week. Um, so it kind of just depends on your schedule, but it sounds like you're busy. And I would say because you sound like you've got a good amount of writing experience, um, that'll open up your options, whether you do end up buying or leasing. I always encourage folks to take lessons because not because I'm trying to be a party pooper and stop you from getting a horse when you want to get a horse. At the end of the day, you do what you want to do, but it does open up options for you. And as you start shopping sale ads or lease ads, um, I don't know so much about lease ads, but I know when I look for sale horses, it seems like the majority of horses that are available for sale, they say intermediate rider and up. Um, and, there's, and there's a lot of beginner horses as well, but it just opens up the pool quite a bit for you. Um, so I would, I would start, I, and I don't know if you're already connected to barns in your area, but one thing that I found just to be really practical, having a barn that's close to you, whether that's on your way to work or on your way home from work or near where you live, if you've got to commute an hour to get to the barn, the chances of you riding or seeing your horse go down quite a bit. At least I know they would for me. And so I would start reaching out to some of my local barns that are on my commute or near where I live, see if there's anyone that's looking to lease the horse, maybe start there. Um, I mean, as far as buying goes, I'm working on more videos. I've, I've got quite a, a couple posted already on my channel talking about questions that you can ask, so you can check those out. Uh, but if you've got anything more specific, you were looking for in terms of tips, you know, feel free to, to shoot another question down there. Uh, but I do think leasing is a nice option to kind of help you figure out how much time you actually have. And that'll help you figure out um, the level of horse, basically, that when it comes time for you to buy energy wise, that you can fit into your life in a way that's going to be comfortable for you, right? You don't want to be stressed out going, I got to take care of my horse and I got my job over here. Blah, 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 blah. You know, it'd be nice to find something that, is, oh, he's, he's a good fit, right? Uh, Abby, question. Any advice about a horse, a pony that gets nervous and speeds up at his gate a lot? Um, I'm assuming you're just talking about the faster paces that he gets nervous and, and speeds up. You know, that, that would be a great question to check with an instructor or a trainer about. One thing that I am noticing just with fame that I'm working on is relaxation in general. Uh, because sometimes horses, I've noticed, speed up because they're excited, they're enjoying themselves, and they, they're just naturally forward and they like to go. Sometimes horses will speed up on trail anyway because they're trying to catch up with uh, a herd, 
or because they're competitive and they want to be in front and they don't want the horse behind them, right? So there could be a lot of reasons for it. And I'm noticing Fame is sensitive. He's got a little bit of just anxiety that I've been trying to work on with him in terms of him just being relaxed. There's certain situations that I notice he's more nervous than others. And those are the situations where he tends to rush, right? I get on him and he's like, okay, let's go. And he's more sensitive in the bear. Oh gosh, you know, he's got all these kind of um, reactive responses as opposed to more settled, confident responses. And I'm sure some of that is me. So I'm working on myself too. Uh, But I am trying to kind of play around with what exactly is it that's causing his anxiety? Is it because he's getting cued in the legs and, and my cues are unsettling, maybe not gradual enough? Is it because I'm not consistent and clear? And so in general, I'm thinking about the arena because we, we're trying to work on improving more of our arena stuff. And one of the things I'm realizing is I'm probably not as consistent as I need to be for him to feel more relaxed. Um, So honestly, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of reasons. And our first inclination, at least my first inclination is to, you know, we want to use our reins to try and slow the horse down. Um, And, and that I think is just one part of the equation. You know, there's a lot to why a horse is nervous and why they speed up that has more to do with just pulling on their mouth, right? So I would start figuring out, you know, what are those extra pieces? Um, Consistency, your cues, the environment uh, that might be making him nervous and wanting to speed up. And again, if you've got an instructor or a trainer that you can ask for their input, that's always, I think, a a huge, huge help to get, get some professional eyeballs on the situation. Tara Howell, are there any... Ooh. Carol, can you talk? Uh, whoops. Sorry, my chat is getting behind. Another thing I'm noticing too, so YouTube offers a super chat function. Um, so if you guys are wanting to bump your comments to the top, I think that's an option as well that you can you can check out. Um, okay. So... Tara had a question. Are there any sports you would want to dabble in just for fun? Yes. I am high on endurance right now. And I'm trying to learn more about endurance. And I have a friend who conditions horses for Tevis. So she's been a wonderful resource. And I'm watching some endurance stuff online. And I'm really wanting to go check out Tevis this year, which is in Auburn. So for those of you who don't know, Tevis is kind of like the... Well, endurance people are kind of going to ping me on this. but it's sort of like the Olympics for endurance riding in the United States. It's it's one of the biggest events. There's also the, I think, national championships. So there's a couple of big events, but Tevis is kind of known for being this really intense 24-hour endurance ride. You ride in the dark, you guys. <laughs> I watched this documentary on Tevis. I was like, oh my gosh, I need to do this. This is intense. You ride in the dark. You ride over a swinging bridge, you go through water, you're on these steep drop-offs. I think the elevation change over the course of the whole ride is like 10,000 feet, something ridiculous, right? Massive hills. And uh, people ride, they start at like four in the morning and they finish at like four in the morning the next day. Uh, The first place winners usually are getting in at like 10 p.m. Uh, And there's six or seven, I think, checkpoints. So you do stop periodically use the restroom, eat, drink. Your horse needs to eat and drink. There's vet checks, uh, but uh, it looks really exciting. So I'm interested in endurance. And then I do follow some mounted archery ladies on Instagram that I just think are amazing. And I I took archery for about five minutes when I was about 10 years old. So I'm like, oh, maybe I could get into that again. I don't know, but it looks really cool. Could you guys see fame as a mounted archery horse? Wouldn't that look amazing? So well, yeah, that's that's got my eye right now. Victoria Purdy, what is the best horse advice you've ever received? Ooh, um, I just finished. Speaking of more books, when I was camping, I finished this book by a guy named Mark Rashid. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Called Whole Heart, Whole Horse. There are a couple of things he said in that that really resonated with me. Um, one 
is that this idea that mistakes or failures aren't failures. If you learned something and you walked away from that experience, a better person, a more informed person, uh, a person who has a better relationship with their horse, then it's not a failure. It's not a mistake. And I realized that over the years, you know, this, there's so much talk about how sensitive horses are and how, um, you know, people are the ones who mess horses up. And I get that. Um, but I think for someone like myself, after a while, it, it becomes really demoralizing. And I sometimes will be afraid to make mistakes or to try something new because I'm thinking, oh, what if I, what if I mess up my horse, right? And so it was very encouraging to just kind of know like that horses are resilient too. Yes, they're sensitive, um, but they're also resilient and that it's important for me to, to make the effort and to try things and to know that I'm human, I'm going to mess up, I'm going to make mistakes and to have grace for myself with that. And I think that's why when I opened the live stream and I was trying to encourage those of you that are new with horses, you know, yes, there is a lot of input in the horse world about how people mess up their horses and how you don't want to do this, or if you do this, you'll create this problem. It's good to be aware of that stuff, but it's also really important to, to be willing to take steps and to try things and to know that you are going to make mistakes and, and that's okay. And you try to do what you can to protect yourself and protect your horse, but you're not going to be perfect. And that's part of it. And, uh, and so I, I, I really got a lot of encouragement from that, knowing that you know, I'm not going to break my pony <laughs> and, uh, and to keep, keep sticking with it. And so I'm, I'm starting to get to a point now where I'm like, all those discouraging voices, I have to really filter that out and try to stick with what's me move forward today. And sometimes that's my own voice that I, my own naysaying voice. Wild Explorer, do you get bored with your horse? I think that's what you're asking. Do I get bored? Um, I I don't get bored, but I do get frustrated. And a lot of that is because growing can be frustrating. And and this is where horses has been extremely powerful for me personally, in that I'm the type of person that I want something, go after it, boom, boom, boom. I research it, figure it out. You know, a lot of it happens up here. And with horses, a lot of it, you know, is not on your timetable. And it's about learning patience and it's about learning diligence and it's about consistency when things are hard. Sorry, my puppy has an ear infection. So if you hear her shaking her head, that's that noise. We're going to the vet later today. Um, So I would say that, you know, sort of the the negative emotions that I might experience with my horse aren't really so much boredom as it is wanting to either figure out what I, what the issue is and how I can fix it or, you know, um, wanting to be further ahead than, than we are and not being patient with the process. Grace, what's your favorite part about writing? Um, mm. I would say the moment where I am on that edge of pushing myself, thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to do this? Can I do this? I don't know if I can do this. And then doing it. That threshold, that thrill of realizing that I have superseded my expectations or my fears or whatever and crossed that line into... I'm doing it. We're doing it. This is amazing. And to give you an example, uh, talking about writing anxiety, right? We went, we went camping this last weekend and it had been a, a little while since I had loped on the trail. And I was with a girlfriend of mine and she's a very confident writer and I love riding with her. And the horses, the boys were both kind of a little bit jiggy and we're like, you know what? We got this big wide trail, big hill. Let's just go for it. And, uh, and I was like, okay, oh yeah, that's what this feels like. Whew, that was a little scary. And now we're doing it. And oh my gosh. And I'm looking around and I'm going, I'm on a trail loping with my horse in this gorgeous place. And this is amazing. And I have been trying to practice just doing things with one rein. And so I switched hands, worked on my balance, stuck my one arm out, you know, as we were going at a little bit of a speed and 
And those are the moments that give me a lot of confidence about myself, the hard work's paying off, that I can do this, all that stuff. So I'd love to know what you guys, what your favorite riding moments are. If you've got a, a point when you ride that you just, everything comes together for you or a specific memory, let me know in the comments. Tara, can you talk about your experience where you were more green than your horse? Yes. Talked about making mistakes and your horse being forgiving. Um, so this goes back to my first horse, Jake. And um, so some of the things that I did with him, he lived out in pasture and I liked bareback riding him. So like one time I was like, I'm just going to go out there and try to get on him. And so you see all these videos, right? People hopping up on their horse from the ground, bareback. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll try that. And he was such a good boy. He stood there for me. And I accidentally kicked him in the hip at one point trying to get on. It was terrible. Eventually got on. And, you know, I didn't realize at the time that his connection to that herd was so strong. And the herd decided they were going to go, you know, up to the top of this hill, which was a good distance away. So all of a sudden, he just is like, oh, we're going. And I had no equipment, nothing. And I was like, oh, I'm basically on my horse. And we're just going to go. And I don't have any say here. And I realized later that, you know, maybe that wasn't the safest situation to put myself in. Again, he was, he was a pretty good boy. But we ended up going through some gnarly stuff to get up this hill. And I'm like, I don't really want to get off right now. I'm not sure if that's a good idea either. So I basically got taken for a ride. And, uh, and again, it was fine. But like, that's not something that I would, I would do now. Um, what else did I do? Um, you know, just not, honestly, just not knowing about rain management. Uh, I literally just pulled him out and got on him and just went. And I didn't realize that there were uh, situations, you know, like we'd walk near some some wire on the ground and the idea that they can get their feet caught up in that and that could be a nightmare. Um, I loaded him in a trailer that wasn't attached to a truck, which apparently is not super safe either. Um, I'll have to think more about some of the things that I've made. But in general, I just realized that there were writing things, management things. Like I didn't know what a horse looked like when they dropped weight. So one winter he dropped some weight and I didn't realize it. And I felt really bad and I was working to put weight on him again. Um, what would I do differently? Um, from a personal standpoint, I mean, obviously we learn from our mistakes. And so I, I don't regret, so to speak. Uh, because it's helped me be who I am today. But if I were to do it over, if I were to encourage someone, I didn't know leasing was an option at the time. This was 10 or 12 years ago. I'm sure leasing existed, but I just didn't know about it. So I probably might have tried leasing a horse first, uh, just to give me a better idea of what I wanted and to get better at riding. So that when I did go shopping, I could maybe pick a horse that was a little more advanced. Um, and I think it would have been really nice to have someone I trusted in my life, some kind of mentor, again, whether that's a trainer or an instructor, uh, because I have benefited so much from having experienced people in my life. And yeah, I think it would have saved me a lot of confusion and, you know, mistakes, especially when I got fame too, because fame was really a step up for me. He was only five, he had 30 days of training, and I had a lot of uh, expectations of him based on my first horse that weren't really fair for him that got both of us in trouble. I basically was like, oh, he's really calm. Performance great. I should be able to do with him all the things that I did with Jake. And yeah, not exactly. He, he has the potential, but he's getting there. Eva, do you like gated horses? Yes. I love gated horses. Let me know if you love gated horses too. I uh, I took a lesson on a gated horse last year. It was a Tennessee walker, and it was probably one of the most fun experiences I've had on a horse in my life. Now, I will preface that by saying that I have ridden a gated horse that either did not gate well or I did not know how to gate, gate it well. And it was the most uncomfortable ride of my life. So huge extremes. And if those of you that are looking into gated horses, they can be phenomenal rides. But a lot of it depends on the horse learning 
its gates properly. So it's not pacing, but it's actually gating. And then you knowing how to cue the horse properly for that. So that's a big success factor. Nadine, you should go to Washington State. I would love to go to Washington State. It's so green and beautiful up there. I would love to go up there. Caroline, what is your favorite kind of horse? Oh, I mean, breed-wise, I, I can't pick. There's too many for too many different reasons. Um, I, I would say my favorite kind of horse at this point, this is sort of a non-answer, sorry, but an enthusiastic, willing horse that I can make a connection with. I would say is my my universal divider. Uh, but yeah, I mean, breeds, gosh. I love the big, chonky draft horses of all kinds. Dutch, Dutch drafts, drum horses, shires, gypsies. I mean, obviously, um, I'd love to try an Icelandic at some point. I went to Iceland and it was beautiful there. And I would love to try an Icelandic horse. There's a club near me. Um, and I've seen some of them in person and they're just so cute. Uh, and then I just, I kind of like weird random breeds. Like I would love the chance to meet a Noriker or, um, gosh, what is it? A German or is a black, black forest horse or something. I had a comment recently. Someone has one of those. I'm like, that's amazing. So I like obscure stuff. Wild Explorer, how old were you when you started writing? Took my first lesson at 13. And I think I only took lessons for like a few months. Didn't really jive with my instructor. So I ended up kind of getting out of it. Dragonfly Fragment, what has been your favorite horse camping trip so far? Ooh. Um, I mean, in terms of location, there is a park not too far from me called Joseph Grant that's beautiful to ride. Uh, but I would say the um, November trip that I took to Lake San Antonio, and I have a video, that was huge for me just simply because it was a personal milestone. I had not loped fame that fast. I think we were actually, we were galloping at that point. Sorry, puppy with ear issues. Uh, I had not done that at that point since I had fallen off. And so for me, it was a huge emotional milestone because I didn't imagine us doing that and me feeling joy. And I did. And it was great. Uh, did I ride when I was a kid? No. So yeah, so my first experience, I mean, I went on nose to trail rides, you know, those paid one hour rides that you can do where the horses are just totally dead broke and dull. Like I've done those as a kid, but, um, my first lesson was when I was 13. So that's one thing too, you know, if I can be an example for anyone is you don't have to have been riding since you were in diapers to be doing this thing, right? I got started as an adult kind of figured it out. And if that's you and that's your story, you can do it too. Um, I know a lot of people that you meet in the horse world have been in it their whole lives and it can be really intimidating. One of the challenges that I found with experienced horse folks is that they're amazing to talk to because they have a wealth of knowledge. Uh, they often don't remember what it feels like to be a beginner because they, they don't remember what it feels like to look at a horse and not know maybe confirmationally what, what you're looking at. Or they don't maybe remember how it feels to not have a solid seat or a knowledge of how to work the reins. And so that's where I think connecting with other beginners or new riders or people that have come to this later in life can be really helpful in feeling like you're not alone because, you know, not everyone has that, that wealth and that history of, of experience. I went trail riding out of state, would I need a Coggins test? That's a good question. I think so. I think when you travel between state lines, it's good to have it. You might not necessarily have to present it, um, but I do think that would be something to ask your vet. I think it might be a yes. Yeah. Yeah, Wild Explorer says, oh no, my mom is still. Okay. Grace. Do you give your horse special treats? And if so, what kind do you recommend? I find that Fame really likes carrots. He doesn't like apples. So horses are individuals just like us, right? Not everyone likes juji fruits or Snickers bars. So um, Fame likes carrots and Fame likes Mrs. Pasture's cookies. So he has high-end taste because Mrs. Pasture's cookies are not, not cheap. Um, so those, those are special occasion treats that he gets. 
Shelby, thank you for the advice. I'll ask around some barns in my area for leases. Started out riding in English, but want to get into Western. Very cool. Should I look for Western ridden horses to lease instead? Yeah, I would say if you're wanting to do what the Western thing, that, that would be the direction I would be looking for. Um, this is one thing I've noticed about like with sale ads. Sale ads will say, oh, this horse can go English or Western. And I'm always skeptical of that because the disciplines are quite different. And depending on to what level, obviously, you're riding in those disciplines. But I mean, if you look at like, if you guys Google Western pleasure horses, if you go on YouTube and watch Western pleasure, right? If you watch how that horse, the reins, the head, uh, the trot, it's all very slow, relaxed, they're slow. And then you you go watch, um, you know, eventing or maybe a, an English sport like hunter jumpers, right? And they usually have a lot more rain contact. They're in different bits sometimes. Um, just there's so much that's different. And so when people say, oh, a horse can go both, I don't know. In my experience, when I've talked to people like that, it's just they happen to have both saddles and they can put both saddles on their horse and the horse doesn't freak out about it. But to truly excel in both types of disciplines, it's very, there's a lot of significant differences is my point. Um, so you know, that's something to vet, obviously, when you're shopping. Uh, but yeah, I would I would shoot for a Western lease if that's the direction you think you want to go with your riding. What kind of horse is Fame? Fame's a drum horse. So it's a cross between Gypsy Vanners and or Clydesdales or Shires. And his mix is a Gypsy Shire. Tara, what are some of the benefits of owning a horse? You read things about therapeutic, balanced fitness, or bonding benefits. Wondering if you feel like any of that's true or significant things. Yes, I would say, hmm, um, I was talking a little bit about this earlier. Definitely from a psychological perspective, having a horse has helped me learn to be more patient, to be more disciplined and diligent, to um, build my confidence just as a human being. And, uh, you know, because there's a lot of, there are a lot of voices in horses and you either figure out who you are and what you believe and what you want to do with your horse, or you just end up really conflicted and anxious because you get so much conflicting advice and input and people offering their opinions that you didn't ask for. So I have found too, in addition to all that, that it's helped me kind of figure out who I am and what I believe and, uh, and to slow down right? You know, this thing could run a mile a minute, my brain, lay down, can't go to sleep. And when you're on a horse, you have to settle, you have to learn to focus, because your horse will give you that feedback if you are, are spun out internally. And I'm not saying I'm great at this all the time, but it's given me a reason to prioritize that. It's also given me a reason to prioritize my health in other ways. Um, I care a lot more about physical fitness than I used to. Um, I'll be honest, when I was younger, I just wanted to be, you know, low body fat and attractive and land a guy <laughs> and uh, got married, landed the guy. And we both just had a lot of time eating out and drinking wine and, and gained weight. And I really struggled getting back into the gym, kind of feeling like, okay, I mean, I know this sounds super shallow, but I'm being honest, like, okay, what, you know, what's my, what's my why here? And I know I should be taking care of myself. But horses has really given me a bigger why for my fitness. Um, when I'm out of balance, not only does it not feel good, but it creates a safety issue too. So I care about lifting weights and being balanced and doing cardio. Um, I think it helps you be a more internally connected person too. So yeah, all of those things are true. And the level to which you take them just could be infinite. And again, I don't want to overwhelm anybody. I think... When I first got started with horses, I didn't know any of these things. I didn't care about them. I just wanted to get on a horse and have a good time. And there's nothing wrong with that. And the cool thing is, is that horses can continue teaching you new things, depending on where you're at in your life, as you grow, that will help you with your relationships, with your job, with your friendships, with your relationship to yourself, all of that. So I love your horse. Thank you. America, thank you for the help. Another question. When buying a horse or looking for an easy keeper, what are things to look for? Is it their breed um, that's an easy keeper? It's it's more individual. Um, I mean, I'm sure maybe there are some breeds statistically that are easy keeper, easier keepers than others. 
or maybe have reputations as being harder keepers. But at the end of the day, I think it just comes down to the, the horse you're looking at. And so that would be asking the seller questions about what that horse eats on a regular basis um, and asking if they're an easy keeper or not. Hopefully they'll be honest with you. Um, a, a lot of it depends on the work that the horse is doing too. So if that seller is telling you, oh, this horse is an easy keeper, but this horse lives in pasture, excuse me, lives in pasture and never gets ridden except maybe once a week on a light one hour ride and you're planning to do more aggressive riding, that could just evolve simply because that person wasn't working the horse the way you plan to work the horse. Um, or maybe you can't keep the horse on pasture, so he's not getting the benefit of eating grass all day. So then you may end up feeding that horse more hay than the seller did just simply because the lifestyle is different. So, um, so yeah, it, would, it just comes down to asking questions of the seller, looking at how big their flakes of hay are, you know, if they feed them supplements and being able to assess if that horse is in good shape when you go to look at them. And this is something that having an experienced horse person can be helpful for. I know in the very beginning, when I first had my first horse, couldn't tell you a fat horse from a thin horse unless they were extremes. Um, so uh, developing your eye for that can take some time. And having an experienced person eyeball that horse and kind of tell you, oh, this horse is just really out of shape. So depending on, you know, when you get them into shape, things could be different or, oh, no, this horse is, horse is already really fit, getting worked a whole bunch. And if this is what he's eating, that's, you know, probably a good, good bet. Uh, so hopefully that, that helps give you a starting point for the easy, easy keeper question. Endurance sounds cool, but super scary. Yeah, I think, I think that's why I'm attracted to it. I'm like looking for a, a, a challenge. Fame and you doing archery reminds me of the girl in the Disney movie, Brave. I know. I think about that scene where she runs off and gets on her horse and goes to that waterfall and climbs it and her horse is rolling in the grass. I love that scene in that movie. Just that connection that she has with that horse that they can just go off together and have a blast is one of my favorites. Oh, we're getting, getting close on time. Okay. You guys are awesome. It's so nice chatting with you guys. I hope you guys are finding this entertaining and helpful and um, always open to just kind of channeling this as you're interested. Favorite breed is Frisians. Frisians are gorgeous. I think the new, is it the new Wonder Woman movie in the very beginning? I think she was writing a Frisian or I want to say they're, they're, they're in the movies like crazy these days. Brave's horse was a Shire. Yeah, you know, Shires and Clydesdales look very similar. I think it might, I think you might be right. I think it might be a Shire. I remember watching the behind the scenes footage and I can't remember. I think they went out and looked at horses and they specifically talked about that. Um, I'm starting lessons this fall. So this is Akanin. Uh, starting lessons when I go off to school. Any starting tips? I want to do what you do with stuff like camping and trail riding. Yeah, it's fun. Um, starting tips. I Okay, so a couple of things. Most everyone, myself included, needs to work on their balance. Our, our tendency is to pitch forward. Uh, I think it's a protective reflex. And I think, too, with all the computer and phone stuff, we're all hunched forward anyway all the time these days. But, you know, shoulders back, keeping yourself balanced and straight as vulnerable as that might feel, um, that's super important. And if your instructor can film you, another thing that I'm finding really helpful is I think I'm straight and then I see a video of myself and I'm still pitched forward just a little bit. So it almost needs, it needs to feel like I'm leaning back to actually be straight. So, you know, balance, that kind of stuff. Um, I think communication with your instructor is really important. When I was Younger, I was a little more timid about this kind of stuff. But, you know, pay attention to how you best receive information and what helps you remember things. Because a lot of times when you're taking lessons, there's a lot to keep track of, right? You got to figure out where your hands go and your, your seat and your legs and you're getting, oh, you know, heels down, sit up straight. You know, you're getting barked at and uh, hopefully not barked at. 
but you know, they're, they're telling you what to do. And sometimes it doesn't always register. And I'm a very visual person. So at one point I actually told my instructor, I need you to like draw with your foot in the sand. If you don't mind what exactly you're talking about or what it is the pattern that you want me to do. Um, and that really helped me out. So, you know, it can be easy to get frustrated because you're getting a lot of input. And so communicating with your instructor and letting them know what helps you learn is, is helpful, I think, for them too in coaching you well. So those would be two, two tips to hopefully get you started. Good luck. That's exciting. Uh, oh, yeah, Brave Horse. Okay, yeah, it is a Shire. Okay. Tara, any thoughts or experience over the with over the internet lessons. Ah, so far I've only found one instructor in my area and she's not sure if she'll have a horse for an adult like me. Very interesting. I have not done over the internet lessons. I've done over the internet. Um, well, I guess maybe you could call it that. I was working with fame and then I was video to the instructor, uh, but it was more about training him than it was about. Um, I mean, obviously you're going to need a horse. So I'm assuming you've got a horse access to a horse. Uh, that you could be riding. Um, so I'm not sure if the instructor is just going to be giving you feedback as you're riding someone else's. If you're filming this and sending it to her or if she's actually like zooming with you in real time or I'm getting real time feedback, if at all possible. Uh, because especially if you're newer, it's really helpful to kind of get the fundamentals done well to start. Uh, if you're more advanced and you're looking for just some fine tuning, you know, I, I honestly have never tried it, so I couldn't give you pitfalls or things to be concerned about from experience. But I would say if I were to try and do internet lessons right now today, I would want to try and figure out a way to do it live. Yeah, even if that meant setting up my laptop on the edge of the arena and putting my earbuds in and staying in like you know, the, the bottom half of the arena so that I'm close enough for her to see something. So, yeah, I'll have to think about that more. That's, that's really interesting. The whole world's going Zoom and digital these days. Chill Salmon, we love you and fame so much. Love you guys too. Thank you. What breed would be good for a new rider? Um, I am big on finding a horse that has the experience and training and temperament fit before a breed. I know a lot of us start off with breed just because we're attracted to a certain look. And that certainly can help you get started when you're looking at ads because there's a ton of ads out there. But ultimately, I would be prioritizing a horse that's suitable for a beginner um, and that has years of experience and um, that's got, you know, the, the training to be able to help take care of you as a new rider as opposed to a green horse that doesn't know what to do and is looking for guidance from you. And if they don't get it, they might get anxious uh, or they may, you know, start taking over because they're like, well, you're not going to teach me. So, you know, Dream Horse is a great place to go look. There's lots of sites out there. I mean, you can find my, I found my first horse on Craigslist. There's drafts for sale. There's equine now. There's horse clicks. There's I think there's even specialized gated sites, but Dream Horse, I think, is great because it's got a very advanced search feature. And you can click on advanced search and pick breeds. You can pick uh, minimum years of training. You can pick which types of disciplines. You can pick geographical region. There's so many criteria that you can whittle down your search to. And I started off searching for bomb proof horses, uh, beginner safe horses, husband safe horses. Um, I think those are the terms that they offer that you can click on. And I would start with those terms and uh, within maybe 100 miles of where you live, something that's drivable. So you can go out and see these horses in a day. And, you know, something that's at least, I mean, there's always exceptions to this, but for brand, brand new riders, I would say probably at least 10 12, 15 is a really nice stage. They've got a lot of experience, even into the later teens potentially uh, can be a really nice fit. But when you start in sort of the 10 and under range, you're getting into horses that maybe only have a few years experience or still are maybe pretty energetic. So I was always advised just to pick like a 15-year-old horse. And I think generally speaking, that's good advice. 
But like I said, there's always exceptions. And if you can get an experienced horse person to help you with the shopping, that's a huge plus. Uh, all right, we're coming on, coming on an hour here, guys. So I'm just going to hit the last couple of questions here. Um, Dragonfly Fragment, did you do lessons before purchase, purchasing? Just asking about versus, yeah. So my personal experience is that I didn't know squat and I just went out and bought something. Um, <laughs> and uh, thankfully, I picked a horse that was so mellow and relaxed that it, I didn't end up, you know, breaking my neck on this thing. Uh, but I did miss out, I think, on growing my horsemanship skills in those early years because all I did was pretty much just get on and walk. And it was fun to explore. I had a blast. I mean, the, the good experiences I had in the beginning are why I'm still here. Um, but now that I know a little bit more, it would have been nice to, you know, start working on my balance earlier and start developing my eye and my feel earlier. Um, so that's why I always recommend lessons, uh, because it will help you give you a starting point at least, as opposed to just knowing nothing. You know, I took a huge risk and I, I did end up with a horse that had, you know, some medical issues that, um, you know, made it hard for us to ride as, as time went on. Uh, so yeah, so I, I do think lessons are helpful. I think lessons are always helpful. But when you're when you're first starting, I think it helps you um, get an idea of what you want to. And that's always helpful when you're buying because it's a big investment. You want to buy something you're going to be happy with for a long time. I love gated horses, especially Icelandics. Yes. First horse preference, a draft. Yeah, drafts are great. Drafts are great. There are a lot of great breeds out there. How long have you been riding? About 12 years. What do you think of the Percheron? Uh, I think they're great. I personally have not ridden one. I went to a, oh, it was a horse show in Woodside, and they had some vaulting horses there, and one was the most gorgeous Percheron. Oh, thick and white with hair like you wouldn't believe. And I know, I know people that have ridden a lot of Percheron and Percheron crosses them. So, uh, what do you think of horse racing? I, I honestly don't know what to think of horse racing. <laughs> I'm not educated enough to be able to make any kind of judgment either direction. I know there's a lot of controversy around horse racing. Um, I personally, myself, <laughs> have never been to a horse race or gambled on a horse. So, yeah, I, I definitely want horses to be well taken care of and i you know horse racing comes under a lot of scrutiny for that and i don't know how much of that is is justifiable or not but yeah really um but i think different disciplines are all have their place all have ability and i think it's great that we as riders can find a discipline that's a good fit for us because uh, it's connected to community, too. It's not just how you like to ride, but it's also the people, inevitably, that you end up connected to. And so I love that there's lots of different disciplines that we can connect with horses and connect with other people on. And there's a lot to learn. You could spend a lifetime hopping disciplines and getting good. So, And I think that's kind of exciting, too. It's like, oh, we'll never get bored with horses because there's just always new things to try. Liz, hope this is a good question to help. What can I buy before I get my horse for a good setup? Mm, um, I mean, a lot of the tack you're not going to know until you actually buy the horse. You want to make sure everything fits that horse. Um, but certainly you could start getting some basic grooming equipment together. You know, your hoof pick, your brushes. Um, and honestly, you're going to spend money uh, spend it in, in educating yourself, I would say, whether that's reading books or becoming a subscriber for a, a trainer that you like online and start watching their videos. Uh, again, lessons, right? Um, but in terms of equipment and stuff, a lot of that will depend on which horse you end up buying. The saddle, the pads, the bridle, the bits, reins, all that kind of stuff. So that kind of stuff you kind of want to wait on. But you could certainly get some of the grooming equipment um, in advance. 
Ashley, would you recommend a drum as a first horse? I'm 31, considering getting my first horse. Took lessons to kid. We'll be taking lessons for a while before getting my first. Sure. Yeah, if it's the right drum horse, they're wonderful horses. Uh, in general, I just hear nothing but positive things about their temperaments. I personally have only had one, so I can only speak for my guy. And I think temperament-wise, he's a, he's a really good boy. And uh, and I think, you know, when I look, because I do check on ads from time to time, you do occasionally see horses that have some experience uh, that are, you know, I think the most recent ad I saw the horse was about 12 and had been there and done that and horse camped and trail rode. Of course, you never know till you go see these horses and talk to them how much experience they truly have. But um, if, if the seller's marketing that horse as a beginner horse, or if your instructor thinks that you are an appropriate rider for a more intermediate horse, there's a lot of ads that'll say uh, intermediate or advanced beginner working with a trainer. And so if, if you fall into those categories and that's what that horse is a good fit for, yeah, I don't see why why drum should should stop you. I think they're great horses. Good age for a horse for an intermediate rider. You know, see, here's the thing. Intermediate rider is such a broad uh, designation. So I think, again, when you're looking at age of horses, it really, again, comes down to that individual horse and what intermediate rider for you means. And this is where having an instructor or a trainer who can eyeball you, evaluate you, give you some feedback on, okay, this is kind of what I'm seeing. This is where I would classify you. These are the types of horses I would say you'd probably be a good fit for is really going to be super helpful because I can't just say, oh, you know, every horse above this age or this age is for XYZ rider. There's just too many, too many variables to say. So, um, so yeah. Sorry, I couldn't be more, more precise. Dragonfly is so important. I've been writing again lessons for a year now, just starting to shop. Good luck. I'm, I'm working on a video on um, horse ads. So this, this is where actually you guys could help me out a lot. I'll put a post up in the community tab. So, so maybe look for it. But any terms that you guys see in horse ads that you're like, what does that mean exactly uh, would be helpful as I'm putting the video together. So I'll put that post up here when we're done and you can respond to that and let me know if there are ad phrases or terms that you're kind of like, hmm, wonder what that means. Um, so yeah, you're very welcome, America. Good luck. I don't have a preference on gender dragonfly, but I know some people really do. Uh, so people tend to prefer geldings because they are don't want to deal with the quote unquote marriage behavior, but you talk to a hardcore mare owner and they will tell you it's the best horse they've ever had. That seems to be the consensus that I get from folks and from friends that I have who have mares. So it really depends again on the horse. <laughs> um, but I've, I've only ever had geldings and I've been happy with that. But I, when I hear people talk about their experiences with their mares, that they have this great experience, I'm like, I want to, now it's like you've been chosen you know if she truly likes you and you connect it's this experience you know who knows i think there are great horses of of both sexes sarah i have not tried the endurance yet but i will let you know for sure uh i've been recommended a 13 year old and i've been riding for six years libby okay if that's what you were recommended and it was a professional that you trust then i would say that's a great starting point Victoria, would I ever sell fame? Oh, I hope no. He's my boy. He's my ride or die. Uh, all right, last question. 02337755. You get, you get points for having the most unique username. You may have answered this already, but what made you want a drum over a gypsy vanner? It really came down to height for me. Um, all the gypsies that I saw in my area were like 14 hands, and I really liked the idea of of a big horse, a tall horse. And so that's where I got hooked on drums. Of course, now that I trail ride as often as I do, I sometimes think a 14 hand horse would be really nice. <laughs> it's easier to get off and on a 14 hand horse and you don't get whacked in the face so much. But I, lo I love my boy. So, all right, you guys. Um, 
Okay, Isaac, last question. How big of a difference would you say there is between Western writing or English writing, if there is any? There are some big differences. Um, and I am not an expert in high levels of either. But from what I've seen, uh, you know, the position in the seat, uh, I hear a lot of English instructors wanting you to be more um, straight up and down, whereas in Western writing, there is more of a ride on your pockets where your pelvis is tilted and you're um, in a slightly back posture. I don't, I don't want to say leaning back, but there's, there's a difference in your torso when you look from a side view. English, they tend to ride with shorter stirrups in general from what I've seen and ride with more contact on the reins. Uh, whereas Western, you've got, you know, the, the slack in the reins more commonly. Um, so yeah, uh, those are some big ones that I can think of off the top of my head, but it really, you get into specific disciplines. And if you're comparing, you know, hunter jumper with Western pleasure versus barrel racing and, um, dressage i mean you could make an infinite number of comparisons but very broadly generally speaking that's personally what i've seen so thank you guys so much for all your questions i love hanging out with you guys hopefully you enjoyed the the live stream um i will post that community post about course ads so please leave me a comment let me know what kind of questions you have with that so i can incorporate that into the next video all right have a great rest of your week and I will see you guys next time. Thanks for joining me. Take care. Bye-bye.